important panel discussion uh, scheduled for today on the subject insolvency and bankruptcy resolutions. I welcome our esteemed panelists, Dr. T.K. Vishwanathan, Shri Bhairam Vakil, Professor T.T. Ram Mohan and Shri A. Unnikrishnan. The panel discussion will be chaired by Dr. T.K. Vishwanathan and moderated by Shri Bhairam Vakil. Uh, just for information, one of our panel members, Sri Anurag Das, uh, the MD and CEO of International Asset Restruction, Reconstruction Company, uh, he could not join us uh, for the panel discussion today. So I request, sir, to uh, please proceed with the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, IIM for being such gracious hosts, to IBBI for this uh, terrific conference and uh, is superbly organized and to all of you i'm surprised if i uh, i'm right then this is the last panel discussion so to have a full room is uh, very gratifying and uh, the least we can do even though there's a really august uh, panel members uh, is that we will you know give you all half an hour at least for questions you all have been such patient listeners so uh, now you know it's your time to speak rather than only us speaking so i i i truly have uh, you know a great honor uh, uh, mr tk vishwanathan is the godfather of ibc the only reason we broke all records 13 months we completed the law start to finish even singapore took three years not often that we move so much faster than singapore was uh, thanks to his uh, stewardship and uh, uh, intellect taking us through the uh, process. And uh, then, of course, we have uh, Professor uh, Ram Mohan, who uh, I think needs no introduction, another huge stalwart. And I have to say the economists on the BLRC were, you know, the ones that uh, gave us a lot of very valuable input. And uh, last but certainly not the least, uh, Mr. Unikrishnan, uh, who is the uh, chief legal uh, head at uh, RBI. RBI, uh, as Mr. Vishwanathan will confirm, you know, played a stellar role right from the inception. In fact, uh, the then uh, governor, uh, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, even hosted us and attended quite a few of our deliberations. And uh, then, as was discussed, a lot has already been said yesterday. But right from day one, when IBC was done with so much effort and speed, uh, it was hardly being used. The only bank that filed it in those days was Innoventive, ICICI. So then the government and RBI had to jump in. You all know about the uh, first 12 cases. And uh, they were the largest ones. So it's quite rare that a new law is hit with the largest cases, all in several billions of dollars. And the great thing, I mean, uh, of course we have to be critical, but sometimes we should also be appreciative of all that has been achieved by all the stakeholders, uh, you know, united in purpose. So uh, we, we achieved a lot, including, I would say, NCLT, NCLAT, uh, all the way to the Supreme Court, that the jurisprudence that was developed in those first three years because of those very complex and huge cases, I think normally for any country, it would have taken at least double the time. So we should now take benefit of that jurisprudence. In many ways, it's like people say a silver lining of this awful COVID problem has been that uh, digital India has done in two years what would have normally taken six years. So it is literally in the same way, if you go through the jurisprudence all the way to the Supreme Court. So those things, uh, you know, with all respect, I would tell the uh, judicial members that they don't need to regurgitate those issues. However, it is actually a large measure of blame is on my community because it has become such a lucrative uh, area of practice that you have the best lawyers in India who are fighting these cases. And therefore, sometimes NCLT, NCLAT, etc., give them too much respect and patience in, especially patience, of course, you deserve respect, but you can't go on and on listening for days on a point that has already been decided by the Supreme Court. That's my point. 
So it is, you know, uh, 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 Sumant said that we should not talk about time, but the problem is, and I'm sure Professor Ramon will elaborate on this, there is a direct nexus between time taken and recovery. So you cannot lose sight of that. Time is of the essence. This is an economic law and you have to keep it. I'll just end by saying you have to keep it simple. We took a lot of pain. We could have made it much more complex. We were talking about a different class of creditors. We saw in US and UK, there was massive litigation on classes of creditors. So we avoided that. It's not that we were not aware of it. So we have tried to keep it simple. It's a, the processes and procedures are detailed. IBBI has done a tremendous job. So there really doesn't need too much application of this natural justice and long hearings. It's, you just see what the procedures are. It's like a referee. You don't become a player in the cricket match. You're like a referee. You see the procedures have been adhered to, you move on. I mean, admission was supposed to be 14 days, not 700 days. So I, I just wanted to reiterate that that was the idea behind uh, the government's idea of coming up with this was purely to get speed, uh, recovery, maintain jobs, and uh, you know, obviously create uh, a healthy environment across. So with that, I'll just uh, dive. Sir, would you like to have some comments, please? Thank you, Baharam, uh, for the setting you described how we did that in 14 months. Uh, I, let me first start with how this week envisaged. There's a lot of history behind it, and I am really the only continuous link in this process for the simple reason. Very rarely a draftsman of a bill gets an opportunity to defend it till the end of its life. It has never been the case. But I had the opportunity of defending two, three acts, and this act is very different type of a code. I've always been saying that this uh, insolvency and bankruptcy code is a jewel in the Indian statute book. Why? I've been, uh, Loris, I've been in the Law Commission as a member secretary. We have done a lot of research, and I've been a legislative secretary. I have drafted many legislations for more than three decades. And I have served all the political masters. And I was a law secretary defending the government. Then I was a secretary general of Lok Sabha where bills were passed. Then ultimately I was with the president when the bills were assented. So that gives me a round the view clock, 360 degrees view of how law is born, what are the forces which shape them. So when Arun Jaitley handed over this task to me sometime in 2014, he was uh, in a very, Bakil was there. He is always, uh, he said, yes, Vishnavin, try your luck. He was also not sure. He told me it's a great challenge. Twice we have made an attempt and we have failed to reform this insolvency framework. You try. Then, but I had a special relationship with Arun Jaitley because two decades ago, he made me legislative secretary when he was a law minister. And he had reposed enormous faith in my drafting skills. The proof of pudding lies in its uh, action. So any legislative policy has to be enacted into a legislation. Unless you get a bill, it's of no use. It can be debated endlessly and it will not see the daylight. So we started the work with great amount of skepticism. Batra knows. I have seen Batra two decades ago when he used to come to the Law Commission. And he was talking about insult conferences in Singapore. He was inviting Justice Ivan Reddy and Jagannath Rao. But not many people understood what he was talking about. We only knew about uh, Provincial Insolvency Act and President's Insolvency Act, and nobody understood whether any cases have been filed at all. Batra has been battling it. Then Justice Vadwa, he started the process, and there is a lot of uh, uh, interest amongst the judges, Sikri, Lokud, others showed much interest and started taking interest in this process. Now, this code, when we started drafting, everybody was skeptical. He said, you are going to bring in one single law for personal insolvency, then also corporate insolvency. What is this? How will you do that? But the, but the directions are very clear. Then we went ahead 
We drafted the legislation in the November 5th. I handed it over in 2015 to Arun Jaitley. It was introduced in December. It was passed in the 2016 budget session. Went before the committee, passed, enacted. In 2016, October 1st, the bankruptcy board came into the Within five years, it has taken. We are all here. I defended the court before the committee. The court, many MPs asked me, "You are just trying to figure out a new profession, resolution professionals. Where are you going to get these people from? The sky you will bring them." I said, "We will a profession will emerge in the due course. We have enormous talent in this country, and uh, this is a piece of law and economics. It is a financial legislation, and it affects our credit market in a great way." Only question is here. <laughs> Credit market today, we know what is ailing them. So we try to address the problems. We have excessive financial dependence on financial institutions. We wanted the bond market to flourish. We don't want people to go to the banks. Most of the problems which are now law, <laughs> we claiming criticism is all legacy issues. We are trying to pass from one legal order to a new legal legal order. And in the such a moment of transition, there is going to be a lot of confusion. and lot of vested interests will be there once these legacy issues are solved then it we will have a credit market which is really healthy and our dream of india becoming a restructuring hub batra used to tell me we always wanted to be a global hub of arbitration but then that is not happening and at least in restructuring we have to have capital to come into india to structure it interim finance will play a lot of role No, I will not go into the specifics. We have been talking about timelines and other things. These are all issues which have come up. But the most important thing about this legislation, which I will say, is in 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 legal research in India, all of you know, it has never been systematic or it's not based on empirical research. All of us know it's all dependent upon some accidents of litigation, some court saying something. When an act is passed by a parliament, each department of the government is interested with. Man, managing and monitoring and operating the act, so they don't have much resources to see how the act is operating. How do you affect? How do you test the efficiency or the effect of any act of parliament? How do you do that? How do you do that? You say this insolvency in bankruptcy code has not achieved its purpose, or what is the test on which you have passed this judgment? You tell me what is the test? You have empirical data. Tell me which law. Under the Indian Statute, I know I am very thorough. The Indian Statute book, thirty years I've lived with them, I slept with them because I am a draftsman. There is no metrics, no valuation metrics except for Income Tax Act, Customs Act, and GST, where people have figures on the hand. They know which item will be taxed, what will be the revenue into. That sort of metrics is not available for any other Indian penal code. Also, is lacking. So, but insolvency in bankruptcy code is address this problem directly. it is based upon research empirical data you have so much of data at your hand now we live in the age of big data data analytics artificial intelligence everything come in then we brought in how to address this information asymmetry rbi is working day in and day out to enhance these things we amended the securitization act to create a registry where more and more secured interests are brought in so we are battling with that now this act is implemented incrementally batra has always been telling when in, when you implement personal insolvency will have lot of social strife you are right we have not touched that for the simple reason we are not indian people common man is not available he is not aware of his, how to manage his personal finance in usa schools are giving this course lessons in personal finance how do you manage your finance how do you create wealth for a healthy share market that is required if we want people to go and play into the share market people should know how to manage it well when the personal insolvency is brought into force you are going to have lot of problem because people don't know they just they have credit card everything is going to end up in <laughs> insolvency how do you do that so we have a fresh start process we need to have more capacity advocacy process to inf- inform these people how to manage the personal finance that this debt recovery tribunals i have given this jurisdiction to them which is highly criticized i know but then if you start a separate bankruptcy tribunal our bill would not be in the table right now you see it took 20 years for a company's labor tribunal to be operationalized went into court so we discussed with the financial minister and he said you do it let us see 
and, and the Lord is done. If you see a need of separate court, we'll do that. But right now, in fact, there is a demand that why are you creating? Pardon? Pardon? Ah. In fact, there was a great demand from the judiciary judges. They are saying, why are you creating separate tribunal? Give it to the high courts. We will handle it. But we had that experience of the official liquidator, all those things. We didn't want to get into the same trap. And secondly, if it has gone to the high court, the government's power to drive that legislation will be lost. Initiative will be lost. They will be looking to the courts for everything. But that has been taken out. But with all the criticisms against the court, it has come out very well. And because we have recovery is not a test to find out whether this act is failed or succeeded. We wanted rehabilitation, but that has to happen. And there are a lot of issues where expertise is emerging, valuation. Valuation is a new area where we are all getting into it. Price discovery in the market economy is very dicey. In government, when we try to disinvest, price discovery was always been a headache because uh, ethical questions were involved in that. It's not really market decision. And then people are afraid of taking decisions because politics centers there. So price discovery gets into this valuation is always bound to have difficulties. But I think in the course of time, things will settle down. Now, having said that, you, you, you have a great potential for this act to set the trend for new form of law research because the government has constituted a committee to look into this working of the court periodically. We brought so many amendments, they are still looking at it. No other act has such a powerful support system. No other act has such a powerful system. Because secretary, here the corporate of a secretary is full-time engaged in this. He has to, he holds meetings, we deal with issues, we try to suggest, we bring in ordinances when necessary. That is a, that is a great thing, no other law. Then secondly, the ecosystem servicing this thing is enormous. This sort of ecosystem is not available for any other act of parliament. If all acts of parliaments follow the same procedure, all the law reform will reach a great height, and this is showing the trend. I don't want to monopolize much. I want uh, now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, I think uh, you know. So again, just to reiterate, uh, and then we'll move on to the current. Though you have heard so much about the amendments that are necessary. So last bit of history is that uh, again uh, uh, the point uh, made that there were some macro uh, goals that we had while uh, drafting this and uh, one of them was to deepen the bond market and to reduce the reliance on the banking sector which was in the mid 80s while in many countries it is far lower and it is almost equal so that the blue chip companies should go to the bond markets rather than putting it all on the bank's shoulders. So I think we have made some good progress there. Of course, uh, as many of you have said, uh, it is still early days. It's six years of which, uh, frankly, two years were lost through COVID. So uh, we are moving in that uh, direction. And the last point was, you know, again, there is a lot of misnomer about operational creditors. The truth is that I would, IBBI has done a fantastic job uh, they are sitting on both sides of the uh, hall. That uh, the data on OCs, if you can generate, because a lot of it, when we say one of the best things that happened, the behavioral change, the credit culture. Yesterday, you also heard the joke, I think Mr. Sunil Mehta made, that previously when someone was a huge defaulter, it was the bank's problem. Now, when they are losing their company, that's not the case anymore. So. This, with the operational creditors, what we were told, especially the small guys that the member also mentioned this morning, they did not even get an audience. They had no chance, no bargaining power. So what we have changed is now they have huge leverage. In fact, sometimes there's criticism from the corporates, they have too much leverage because they can take a company into IBC. So if we can get the data on how much OCs have recovered, either uh, you know through the uh, the threat of ibc or after admission but thereafter 12 uh, a uh, uh, withdrawal i think that will give you a sense that actually the law has helped 
the uh, operational creditors a lot and that was certainly a goal for us because as all of us know msmes are a huge part of our economy and huge part of the jobs so now instead of talking economics i better move to the real expert and uh, 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 professor if i can ask you that uh, besides uh, ibc to create the ecosystem that we are trying to create which are the other parts of the ecosystem other laws which you feel will uh, get us there thank you mr vakil and good afternoon uh, everybody one of the difficulties in being on a panel in the last session is is that uh, you wonder what is the new thing you have to say when so much has been said over the past couple of days and i have to say that you had some very uh, thought provoking and insightful exchanges and observations made in these three sessions which have been uh, quite educative for me uh, personally i think one of the things one can do is to i think reiterate a few points uh, which bear uh, reiteration for the purpose of having clarity or agreement amongst ourselves because unless we are agreed on some basics in relation to the functioning of the ibc it will be very difficult for us to uh, sort of move forward so i think it was very gratifying for me to hear from uh, dr deepthi mukesh the honorable member that the focus has to be on uh, re the recovery rate whether you like it or not because i think we need to be very clear and we need to have some kind of agreement on this because when you say that the efficiency of the system has to be improved which is why i think we are having this conference here and all these deliberations have been going on what we want to see is how to improve the efficiency of this system and you cannot even begin without setting a proper benchmark of efficiency and i for one am unable to see what benchmark what meaningful benchmark you can have other than the recovery rate because if you get into this question or this point which was made yesterday that the bankers are not there merely to maximize the recovery rate but they are also there you know to make sure it's a going concern to make sure that the resolution is achieved etc cetera, etc cetera. if you bring in you know some higher purposes in life other than the recovery rate i'm afraid that's the path to nowhere so i think whatever you do finally the metric that we have to agree on a very fundamental metric is the uh, recovery rate now how do you improve the recovery rate is something which i will come back to later because now i want to sort of address the question which mr vakil has put to me which is what is the what are the larger changes which you need in the ecosystem apart from the changes in the functioning of the uh, constituents of the ibc that we've been discussing over the past uh, couple of days so let's begin by you know just having a basic conceptual uh, framework so you have an asset and the intention is to preserve as much of the value of the assets as possible so once the default takes place you want to make sure there's no further erosion in value or the maximum value is recovered but i think you have to sort of go back further i mean you say that you want to protect the value of the asset you have to go back in the value chain and start from the banker's end so first thing is that once you have created an asset you have to prevent it from turning bad so that's the first thing because once the asset turns into an npa and given the kind of npas that we have in the system if you are going to move such a large number of cases into the ibc system then i'm afraid there's really no uh, salvation from the problems that we are talking about the clogging of cases the delays the low bids the poor recovery rate all these are inevitable once large volumes get pushed into the system so of course i think you know some of the points that were made about streamlining the admissions process they are valid we've been talking about increasing the number of benches increasing the number of judges all that is fine but you see if you take a basic problem such as congestion on the road say the road is congested what is the solution broaden the road is that a solution not really because the moment you broaden the road more traffic will come on to the road so how do you solve the problem of road congestion you have to address the pricing of vehicles you have to make private transport expensive you have to make public transport inexpensive and efficient 
So that's how you address road congestion, not by broadening the road. So what I'm saying is, no matter what improvements you bring about within the IBC system, and I'm not for a moment taking away from any of the suggestions that are made, they're all very valuable suggestions, you have to address the larger system and begin at the banker's end. So within banking, what are the things that need to be done? Well, first, risk management in banks has to improve considerably. So this means not only improving the quality of management, especially, you know, the public sector banks, which still have 65% of the banking system, the functioning of boards, the risk management committee of the board of banks, how are they functioning? What is the quality of board? So you have to begin from there. So first thing is risk management, avoiding concentration risk, et cetera, fundamentals of bank. After that, once the loan has been sanctioned, you make sure that at the first sign of, at the first warning signs, you either exit the exposure or you address the problems that have arisen. Now, a great deal of this happens in uh, project finance. So the moment, because project finance happens over many years, and the moment they, you, know, you discern certain problems or you pick up some warning signals, the bankers swing into action. But in balance sheet lending, I'm sorry to say this doesn't happen, except perhaps in consortium cases and a few of those cases. So I think the capacity to react to early warning signs is simply not there within the banking system. Then after the default happens, what do you do? I think the first job of the banker is to sit across the table with the management of the promoters and try to resolve it at the banker end. So we talked about you know, the role of mediators and you know, the important difference that mediation can make to this entire process. But I would say before that, the bankers themselves need to sit across the table and see what sort of meaningful resolution can be achieved. But what has happened consequent to the IBC, which is perhaps unfortunate, and given the way that the public sector banks operate under numerous constraints, the fear of attracting the action of vigilance agencies and other agencies uh, in respect of decisions that they've taken, what has happened is that the immediate reflexive action of bankers is to push cases into the IBC. So I'm sorry to say that a great deal of preventive and other actions which need to be taken at the bank end, taken at the banking end of the spectrum Unfortunately, I think that has taken a back seat. And the immediate reaction of most bankers is, let's push it into IBC. And if you do that, no amount of improvement in efficiency, the IBC system is going to address the fundamental problems that you have, which is the large volumes which are there. And you know, the, uh, the challenges uh, based on the principles of natural justice, et cetera. Again, it was very gratifying to hear the honorable member speak up for the judiciary, no matter how unpleasant it is for bankers and others to hear this. But I think the judiciary has to a role to play in terms of hearing the other party. And given the infirmities of the legal system, given the problems inherent in standing up for the principles of natural justice, the delays and other things which we are seeing, my contention is they cannot be resolved beyond a certain point. So to look for solutions within the IBC system per se, is not going to do much more than mitigate the problem. And the solutions have to be found much earlier in the entire spectrum. So in this context, let me also say that I'm also in favor of uh, exploring the pre pack process for corporates. I mean, it has happened in the case of SMEs, but not much of that has happened. But in principle, the pre pack process is very valuable because again, it promotes resolution between the banker and the promoter or the management. And then the advantage with prepack is that you put it through the uh, IBC process so that somebody gives a stamp of legitimacy and the banker doesn't have to fear the consequences. So I see the merit about the merit in PP in prepack is that it will encourage the bankers, especially in public sector banking system, to sit across uh, the table with promoters and management and try to uh, resolve problems uh, at their end. So, uh, you know, the basic point which the deputy governor made yesterday, I think is worth re reiterating, which is that the IBC should be the last resort of banks and not the first resort, which is what has been the unfortunate consequence or unintended consequence of the enactment of the uh, IBC. 
Now, the other thing which we're talking about, you know, is just, you know, strengthening the IBC and sending out a message to promoters, et cetera. I think the point which the IMA director made yesterday is worth reflecting on. Uh, what is the benefit that you get? Of course, the creditor's hand is strengthened, and therefore we can expect the economy to benefit from lower cost of borrowing. But we also need to see what this kind of stringency or even strong arm tactics that we're trying to use under IBC, what impact it is going to have on the promoters. I'm really concerned at the debt to equity ratios which we're seeing in Indian industry today. There was a survey of about 1,500 companies done by the RBI, which was quoted in one of the reports recently. And I'm a little appalled to see that the debt equity ratio in these 1,500 or so companies is about 0.2 or 0.25, which is absurdly low, which tells me, which certainly gives me an indication that consequent to the enactment of IBC, the borrowers or promoters are reluctant to take on more debt. Now, you don't want that happening. Is it, that's going to happen. How is investment going to happen in the economy? Of course, the response to this is that industry is not investing because of all the uncertainties related to corona, et cetera. But you know, promoters and entrepreneurs are not looking at two years of corona. They're looking at the long term. And I cannot see anybody who has a reasonable bet on the Indian economy and is looking at 6.5% to 7% growth rate will underinvest to the extent that the debt equity ratio should be so low. So I think when we think about improving the efficiency of the banking system, uh, the IBC, and all the other measures that we are talking about, the larger impact on the economy on, because of the impact it is having on promoters and borrowers also needs to be taken into account. So let me conclude by just saying that when you're looking at the, the economy-wide impact of whatever solutions you're thinking of, then you have to think of the entire spectrum starting from the bankers and going right to the conclusion of the IBC process. If you're limiting your solutions to the IBC end of the spectrum, then I'm afraid you're going to create a new set of problems and perhaps the problems that we have been dealing with we will not be able to do anything more than mitigate them to some, some extent. I will stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, so I, I, yeah, I think that's very clear that there's no silver bullet in life. So it, you have to take a holistic approach. And in a country of our size uh, and complexity, it's, uh, there are certainly challenges. But again, I want one last time to reiterate that I would only request all the players in the IBC process to please keep it as simple as possible. Do not create complexities where uh, they you don't need to. And uh, you know, Sumant is a, a very old and dear friend, so I can say that I frankly was a little surprised by the amount of time uh, your entire panel spent on valuation. Because valuation in the US context, and again, I want to reiterate, we. Uh, advisedly stayed away from the US model. So US model is debtor in possession. US model, the court plays a huge role. Uh, even though Dr. Vishwanathan is steeped in law or through the committee deliberations, it was that keep this, the role of the courts and NCLTs as light as possible. This is very much a economist market driven process. Let the market discover the price. So the only role valuation plays is as a safety net. So for the dissenting financial creditors or the operational creditors, because they don't have a voice at the table, this is a safety net. So I, I think that again, we are, it, it, that we are getting it, it's creating a, a lot of controversy because I guess media, high profile, etc. Uh, the one point that comes out of this and it takes it back to delay, Though Suman said, please stop talking about time, but half the problems are caused by delay, is that if it's more than 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, the experts will decide. I think, sir, then you may have to revalue because the valuation is certainly going to go down. We all know that. And therefore, then the earlier valuation may not hold good. I think the point Suman made. But other than that, to focus so much on valuation, it, the, it is entirely market driven. That, that uh, liquidation of fair value is not the guide for the COC. Whether we like it or not, thank God the Supreme Court has uh, repeatedly said 
do not second guess the coc's wisdom so uh, with that now i will uh, you know uh, mr oni krishnan uh, i i uh, hand it over to you again we talked about you know credit culture which is very very important uh, you know in many many ways because the credit uh, uptake is low but on a lighter note uh, professor ramon i think given where the world is today given where uh, interest rates across the world are today maybe it will be a blessing in disguise that our leverage is so low but i i say that only in a lighter way because one of the key uh, areas where we have a huge uh, amount of uh, walking still to do is infrastructure and in infrastructure we all know the leverage is usually high uh, you mentioned project finance again there you know uh, there were people like sbi playing a big role but we we need to come back to that because again infrastructure project finance has really taken a beating and the country can't uh, do without that and i think again foreign uh, debt and equity will not be that easy to come by so really it will be people like sbi doing the heavy lifting as uh, professor ramon has already taken us uh, i mean i'd be very happy to have your macro broad thoughts but he's already jumped into prepack and opening prepack which i completely agree with and we'll have a detailed discussion on that but in a way i think uh, uh, mr swaminathan uh, ended his panel with the perfect uh, entree to us that there's a bottleneck in the start the admission process we've spoken about a lot of solution uh, i think also the honorable member yesterday mr gosavi said you know just make it one make it simple which is what i personally feel so uh, on the admissions process in the middle the bidding process definitely and i'll also come back to uh, professor ramon on that because if it's not a level playing field we can't get all the international players and the less competition the more inefficient the price discovery is so coming and hitting a 6 in the 21st over is not helpful so we need some amount of clarity on the which the pprp does very well i believe and the last is the exit so that's what mr swami nathan said the entry and the exit the approval on the resolution plans again nclt should streamline that if you have other issues put them apart but at least approve the resolution plan don't let it hang fire so with that so i uh, hello uh... see uh, actually uh, a lot has been said about uh, the delays in admission process in the last uh, few discussions um and uh, i mean if anybody asked me what was the focus of uh, discussions in this uh, uh, three day uh, two days discussion definitely it is a delay now uh, delay part no i i've been a member of the governing board of ibba for the last 6 uh, years and this issue has been coming up again and again that w- what is causing delay Uh, in the ibc process i mean it is it was uh, really interesting to know that initially all the uh, attributes of delay or attribution of delay was being made to uh, the promoters promoters were not cooperating and they were not giving details and then uh, the employees of the company who are loyal to the promoters are not coming forward and giving us the details that was the first allegation secondly it moved out from uh, the promoters uh, to ips see ips are uh, either uh, lawyers chartered accountants or company secretaries and they do not have uh, enough idea about the business therefore it is causing delay and uh, some people uh, i mean it, it was not in the board but sometimes uh, individually also when they come to know that i am a member of the board they come and say no no the uh, judicial infrastructure is quite uh, and uh, they entertain any number of interim applications and it is causing delay uh, i mean many many factors were brought in uh, towards the judicial delay in that and uh, finally uh, it was uh, the members of the coc they are not g- given proper mandate uh, to come to the coc so they are not taking appropriate decisions and uh, that is getting delayed each of them i mean uh, each of them are focusing uh, that is allegation i am not uh, saying yes or wrong. no each of them are uh, is focusing on their recovery how much they will get and not about the uh, general uh, resolution of the this thing these were the general allegations luckily nobody has uh, told me so far 
that it is the members of the governing board who is uh, uh, who are uh, delaying the process maybe they they will wait for uh, me to go out of the board and then they they will come and say you are equally responsible for the delays but uh, see that that has been the general trend so and whenever you, uh, i mean statutorily some time limit is fixed it is always getting crossed say consumer protection act or any other act which is fixing time limits so i mean a recent instance is the amendment of cpc where uh, written statement is to be filed within 30 days which can be extended to 90 days uh, on giving proper reasons but nobody is sticking to that limit and the uh, uh, courts have been interpreting that whenever a statutory time limit is fixed for uh, uh, the judiciary to follow that is only directory in nature it is not mandatory so and if if we go otherwise the uh, effect will be on the litigants i mean i do agree with that so the, there is no point in uh, simply saying that the judiciary is delaying it to say we have fixed 180 days 330 days and uh, uh, nothing is coming within that limit but one recent suggestion uh, which uh, i mean that also has been uh, a focus of attention here focus of discussion here uh, is about uh, a, an automatic admission process now uh, mr wakil was also referring to that a little before uh, and you see this automatic admission process as a, a matter of principle it looks very attractive now there can be some documents which let, let us say that we prescribe by regulation or rules that there are certain documents which can be taken as prima facie evidence of uh, uh, default now i do not know how far uh, uh, the courts can or nclts can proceed without looking into it further just accepting say first uh, suggestion was banker statements uh, a, a certified extract of a banker's book has to be accepted as prima facie evidence of default i mean even prima facie evidence i will accept but people are suggesting that don't take it as prima facie it is proof of evidence i mean as a, as as i was a practicing lawyer i am quite reluctant to accept uh, uh, a bank's uh, uh, statement as a proof of uh, a default of a particular amount i mean there are there were so many allegations so many cases where the documents were wrong and one reason that is again projected is that rbi is inspecting the banks or nbfcs or this thing therefore uh, they have certified that these accounts are proper rbi is not inspecting all the accounts of banks they are uh, the inspectors are looking at special accounts Or, or which they have some information, or they want to uh, uh, create—I uh, mean, see some particular account. Not that everything is verified by RBI uh, inspection team, Now, and even the audits are not that much foolproof. So, taking uh, uh, a what do you call a banker's book as ultimate proof, I'm I'm distinguishing between evidence and proof in this. Evidence is okay because prima facie it looks uh, good evidence, but taking it as proof, I'm not that much comfortable with that idea. Uh, the second thing which is uh, suggested uh, is about acknowledgement of debt acknowledgement of debt uh, if it is a, a genuine document definitely it is an indication that the party is agreeing that there is a debt uh, uh, pending but see I, i know many cases where at the time of granting of the uh, financial accommodation itself people are taking uh, this uh, acknowledgement letters it is only filled afterwards like uh, checks which are given on uh, i mean i'm not saying generally i'm talking uh, in some cases at least that uh, the acknowledgement letters are taken uh, prior to that and there were cases where the party is dead but he has given acknowledgement of the debt i mean that seems to be the uh, kind of evidence that are coming to courts so acknowledgement of debt maybe that also is somewhat an acceptable thing of course uh, subject to uh, say uh, some principles of natural justice that can be so banker statement and uh, acknowledgement of debt these are uh, whichever form it is acknowledgement is in the balance sheet or w- whatever it is in the form of letter is all right but people are suggesting people are coming forward with the suggestions that we should uh, take an advocate's notice a notice from an advocate as a, a proof of debt people are suggesting that earlier restructuring done in an account that should be taken as proof of debt and uh, even uh, some have come to the uh, uh, point that uh, the fact that there is a repayment schedule and the assertion by the creditor that uh, there was no repayment that itself has to be taken as uh, ev- uh, proof of debt or evidence of debt now uh, the, when you go downwards like this it becomes very very questionable and the role of the nclt or the court becomes uh, it increases so much 
now how do you how do you come to the conclusion just on the basis of an advocate's notice which is lying maybe unreplied that there is a default many of these notices are not even reaching the uh, parties so I, i had a case when i was in practice uh, an immediate neighbor who used to come to us and talk in the evening and we used to send a notice and then it comes back saying that parties you know where we found that the door is locked and uh, so that is a way in which uh, the notices are going so all these t- things taking prima facie as proof of uh, default and going on a mechanical way becomes highly questionable then i mean people may ask then what is the way way out i mean i can only say that uh, uh, we have to employ the basic economic principle of uh, people respond to incentives so incentive uh, incentivize the ips incentivize the other stakeholders to act in a timely manner it can be financial or it can be a promotion thing or it can be anything of that sort Con- consideration for new appointment all these things can be taken but accepting certain documents as proof of debt and then going uh, for a resolution or a liquidation or whatever it is it is somewhat questionable because uh, see we are we are all collecting uh, say suggestions from public and it has uh, so that way uh, the stakeholders can come out with comments on what is uh, the appropriate mode to decide what is prima facie evidence and then on that basis we can start the initiate the process okay thank you thank you thank you very much uh, dr vishwanathan anything uh, on uh, the changes and amendments to make it more i will just uh, like to add to what onigishan has been saying Uh, you know, there is a need for a urgent public uh, records registry act you will agree with me and now uh, in 2016 the act surface act has been amended to make it mandatory for all security interests to be registered with the central agency there is, there is act it is i don't know whether it's been brought into force and they have identified what are the transactions which should be registered and then this they said it will be a deemed to be public notice so and ultimately we need to have a public records registry where you can capture all ancillary information that is very important defaults occurring in electricity bills credit card bills etc that gives you a holistic picture about the credit status of an individual and all your uh, difficulty about proving it that becomes historical thing i think that is essential no question i think in fairness uh, you know there were uh, the successes were the regulator of course was set up again in record time and has done a terrific job i think that everyone will be unanimous on uh, i i think sir you mentioned about uh, the insolvency professionals so that was a brand new set of professionals everyone was very concerned i think in uh, Six years, we have almost uh, doubled the number of insolvency professionals as the UK. Of course, our population is also slightly larger, but uh, I, I think it was a, a tremendous uh, effort on everyone's part. I think information utility it was first of its kind. Uh, I think, uh, to the best of my knowledge, no other country had it. Just like no other country had the boldness to uh, do Section Twenty Nine A. and uh, that has is still uh, it, you know uh, has again got a lot of miles to go it took the longest and uh, i i completely agree that we need to have this uh, as mr unikrishnan and dr vishwanathan have said all i am saying is that if all other areas whether it's uh, medical every area in the world has benefited from technology we can't be so different i mean also covid has shown it now uh, so we have to take the benefit of technology of course the documents should be prescribed by uh, ibbi and don't let uh, perfection you know uh, uh, going for perfection ruin a good result so i think we we do need to make some uh, progress there and so now you coming back to the three parameters very quickly you were mentioning i mean what we normally say is uh, of course recovery is the first so uh, pre ibc it was 22% it went to a high of about 46% now it has dropped uh, ibbi will have the best statistics but i think it may be 40 uh, people say don't take the best cases 
that's ridiculous i hope you agree because then you don't take the worst cases you have to take the stats as they are so we've doubled the best in class singapore canada etc are in the 70s so we have a, a lot of room for improvement no doubt about it the second stat is time which is directly uh, correlated time from 6 years we uh, again you know we started with 270 then we made it 330 of course the courts have said that this is not mandatory but for a, for many years up to the first 3 4 years pre covid we were less than one year less than one year is best in class whether you take singapore us uk everyone that's that's it they're all in that ballpark so actually the main thing was not to slip unfortunately we have definitely slipped so uh, from being best in class we have dropped again we have to just make sure and that's why we are spending so much time on it the last one is cost and on cost we were around 9% we are now around 1% and i dare say 1% will probably be again best in class i can't think of a jurisdiction that will do better on that so professor those are the parameters that i get from uh, ibbi i'm sure there's uh, you know parameters that we have missed out we can do better but again comparatively uh, we have a lot of international colleagues here i think we are doing a reasonable job uh, your views on that and any other observations any other insights ibc or ecosystem that you would like to say before i think we'll do one last round and then i promise the floor we'll give them sufficient time but yes <clears throat> so you know i began by saying that you need an operational benchmark uh, for testing efficiency and the one that uh, suggests itself to me is as i mentioned you know the recovery rate and all the other things that you're talking about you know the time taken etc the delays they all have a bearing on this benchmark and i think so we sort of need to resolutely focus on this so when we test the working of the system or the constituents thereof so whether it's the committee of creditors or or uh, you know the insolvency professionals or ibbi itself i think the working has to be tested against this benchmark and the question that we need to ask is what is the tightening that we need to do in respect of each of these constituents so that we arrive at a benchmark we meet the benchmark in a way that is extremely satisfactory so the recovery rate is 35 or 40% or whatever is regarded as acceptable i think i think that has to be the operational goal so let me let me just look a little more closely at the functioning of you know two of these constituents the committee of creditors and the insolvency professional so the insolvency professional among other things is providing a liquidation value based on valuation received from two different people and i think i think the important question that has arisen is how do we how do we know that this valuation is correct and you know no matter what you may say uh, you say you know there there's really no question of getting away from the valuation issue so whether it is you know the ibc or you know disinvestment or privatization or whatever all the controversies eventually center on unsatisfactory valuation if you don't get the valuation right then you're going to discredit the process so we should not be surprised that the standing committee of parliament focused on the poor recovery rates because in the mind of the public and therefore in the mind of the representatives of the public this is going to be a highly contentious issue and so you cannot say you cannot brush it aside now the what we heard uh, in respect of you know the valuation done so far is that it's subject to peer review but i'm sorry you know i think no peer review is ever going to be satisfactory see this principle of self regulation has not worked anywhere it does not work for the stock exchanges it does not work for the investment bankers it does not work for the brokers it does not work for nbfc so self regulation is no regulation at all so somebody performs somebody else evaluates and therefore we need an independent evaluation of all these valuations that have been done so i will come to that very quickly so let me just state the principle that all all this which is happening under the aegis of these different constituents needs to be subject to an independent evaluation now what about the committee of uh, creditors so we heard time and again from all the participants the you know the ruling of the honorable supreme court which is that the wisdom of the Com committee of creditors is supreme 
and we also heard that you know that has come up for some kind of a challenge and the hearing is due before the honorable supreme court so the committee of creditors i mean how does it function so you have to compare the bids that you received against the liquidation value so we looked at the liquidation value let's look at the bidding process how efficient is the bidding process one of the conditions for efficient bidding is that you should have multiple bidders in how many of these cases have we had a large number of bidders have we examined this what attempts have been made to ensure that there are a large number of bidders now in some cases it may be necessary to give the mandate to an investment banker to go and find bidders they are not going to come to you just because you put up something at some website they are not going to come because of that or do we need to create an online platform which is marketed internationally where all these things are given a much you know these this entire these cases are given a much higher profile so unless the bidding process is made more efficient and i say one of the condition there are a number of conditions for efficient building bidding you should not have collusion you should not have information asymmetry etc but i think from the operational point of view the very basic requirement is that you should have a large number of bidders because without that you're not going to get a bid which is attractive enough to be compared with the liquidation value and the you know the, the more the number of cases where the bid is close to the liquidation value the greater is the room for controversy and the greater is the potential for this entire process to be discredited now one of the things which uh, i want to submit to you for your consideration you know is this section about not allowing a defaulter to bid now this seems sort of automatic you know many people take it as a given so you don't want to encourage moral hazard by allowing the promoter to come in and bid where there's a case for default but the question i want to put to you is what about cases where the default has clearly happened for reasons beyond the control of the promoter so an adverse court judgment i mean at the time of bidding for the 2g licenses who would have examined who would have imagined that those licenses would be cancelled how on earth is the promoter to know when you are bidding for the coal blocks how do you know that the coal blocks are going to be cancelled so when a banker is lent to a miner how do you know that the mining license is going to be cancelled so in all these cases is it possible for i mean since we grant that the wisdom of the com uh, committee of creditors is supreme can we allow them to uh, take a call on whether in a given situation the default has happened for reasons beyond the control of the promoter and therefore you allow the promoter to come in in the interest of getting a higher recovery than otherwise so you know you may wonder you know why i keep harping on this issue of recovery because unless you are focused on this my concern is that this entire process will get discredited for this reason alone in any uh, privatization or dis disinvestment case the moment the valuation question is not addressed satisfactorily immediately it's going to translate into a scam it has already translated into a scam you know in the case of the hotels which were sold 20 years ago the, the honorable courts have revived that on precisely these grounds so whatever the conceptual cons you know uh, reservation some people may have about the recovery rate etc what i'm saying is from the operational point of view you, you cannot get away with it and therefore we have to see how we can strengthen the different constituents with a view to attaining a better recovery rate and the point i would make to you is that there is a need for an office of independent evaluation to be set up under the aegis of the uh, ibbi which will take a, a sample of cases which have uh, happened look at the valuation look at the resolution look at the resolution time look at the functioning of the committee of uh, creditors etc so this is basically replicating what is happening at the imf where the imf is an office of independent evaluation to look at a sample of cases which the imf has dealt with now if that is not satisfactory then i would say that you need an independent audit of the ibbi itself in fact there is a case for i've been uh, pushing this before the honorable uh, standing committee of parliament of on the attached to the ministry of finance that in the case of all regulators you need periodical independent audits by mn professionals whether it's rbi or whether it's sebi or ibbi or anybody else you need an independent audit to see whether the outcomes 
are in accordance with the expectations and what needs to be done. So you, you need to look at the outcomes and you need to look at the internal processes as well. But if that is considered too radical a move, I would say that a starting point would be to set up an office of independent evaluation within the IBI, IBBI itself. Thank you. Thank you. No, I... Terrific, terrific. Is it there in the public domain? Is that report there? Yeah. No, IBBI has definitely been a, a path breaker on many of these issues. On 29A, the truth is it's a, it was a decision by the government, very clear, eyes wide open. Uh, and it, it's up to them now. I just want to make one point, you know, uh, the telecom uh, license issue comes up again and again, that you have to be a continuing defaulter. So if you are not a continuing defaulter, there's a period of time before that you go uh, to the banks or go into IBC, then you are not going to be uh, hit by 29A. So the idea was that there were historic repeat offenders and that is why 29a came if today the government feels that times have changed we've cleaned up all the backlog uh, so be it i mean that's a decision for them to take but on the valuation also one more time i want to reiterate liquidation value is certainly not the aspiration of uh, ibc we if you're getting just liquidation value something has gone terribly wrong Again, there were a lot of historic cases. If you have been in ICU for six years, you can't, you know, the odds of you jumping up healthy are very unlikely. Now we've probably gone through most of that backlog. So today, unless the asset is so bad, uh, I, I don't think the aspiration is liquidation value. That's all the point I'm trying to make. It was a safety net for the dissenting. It was not an aspiration like it is in other jurisdictions. So. I just wanted to be clear on those. Uh, so uh, also I wanted, uh, you know, uh, your thoughts on, uh, because there's been so much said about PPIRP, uh, and Professor also said it's probably an idea whose time has come. Uh, there are issues uh, that it's debtor in possession. We've talked a lot about mediation. So they're saying, you're, you know, it's against the basic architecture of IBC. Uh, but I think in a way, the sooner we resolve, the better it is. We all agree with that. So if it's debtor in possession, it is de facto mediation. It, it may be the right thing to do at this point. I think we discussed that in the committee. I know uh, we have to deal with the sectorial uh, adjustments. So we thought we will try. It has worked well in UK and other places. Let us see. I just want to quick rejoin it to Professor Ram Mohan's uh, uh, two queries. I, I understand this uh, economist's uneasiness with dealing with lawyers' way of thinking and working. He said about setting up benchmarks for acts. I'm afraid that is loaded with a lot of value judgments because in, in acts, of, different people view different acts in a different sense. Even parliament doesn't know what is the object of the act. They enact something and then it acquires the soul of its own. So that becomes contentious. So what is the role, what is the object or the benchmark for IPC? How do you judge that? Is it to punish people or is it to be a crimeless society? So the two people will never agree. Ultimately, that will be a justiciable thing, will go to the court. That's our difficulty because lawyers, we are uh, arguing, we'll never agree on anything. It goes on litigating. That is our, we have to pardon our profession. <laughs> Secondly, 29A was, we never wanted 29A when we drafted it. We were aware of this problem. We wanted the committee of creditors to be sovereign. Very clearly, finance ministers said they are sovereign. They can do anything. They should not be questioned in a court of law or by the tribunal. He was very clear. 29A, all of you know why it came in. Because of somebody, people started gaming the system, so it was brought in. And so that has created a problem because it was never in our idea. We What you said was in our mind. If, beyond your control reasons you have fall, then the banker should take a credit. So this has caused some problem because of how people started, uh, I mean, when you, 
when people try to resist vested interest things happen it is the result of that hmm? no i mean as you must promised. advise the government <laughs> sir your view and i would love i would love to hear i'd love to hear mr unni krishnan on 29e and uh, on the uh, ppip for uh, thrown open to everyone i mean 29e in, in fact the msmes there it there are you know that's another point i wanted to make to you ibbi i think has done a terrific job wherever there's a good asset and of course all the other bankers both domestic and international so wherever there's a good asset we see a lot of uh, i mean just now for reliance i think there were 56 eois so i don't think that is a big issue the big issue comes in the smaller companies there it is an issue and there the promoter is usually the main guy who's going to give you the best deal so knocking him out is going to create many more liquidation but all i can tell you is that this was eyes wide open that's all i can say so uh see uh, one thing uh, you were talking about that uh, assessment uh, he already said that there is a, there was an external assessment assessment we have an internal assessment also the board members uh, assess the their performance so actually we have a tendency to give 100 marks to ourselves but that, <laughs> uh, that is part of it but there is there is an evaluation of what is done both by the board as well uh, i mean board means governing board as well as the uh, insolvency board as a separate institution yeah no th- there is an evaluation there is an external evaluation there was and then uh, that report is uh, yet to be discussed uh, and the other thing uh, on that uh, uh, on regulation making uh, we have a principle of uh, say going by the cost uh, benefit analysis i mean that is what we are supposed to do so what will be the benefit of uh, uh, a regulation but we don't attribute any any particular figure to that this will be 50% beneficial or 100% beneficial we, uh, i mean taking together you usually this principle is taken from the administrative procedure act in us so there has to be a cost benefit analysis and many of the newer legislations are putting that uh, whenever a regulation or a uh, subordinate uh, this is made you have to uh, evaluate the costs and benefits so it is somewhat uh, generalized thing but there is an assessment there is a general assessment of what are the benefits and uh, losses in that okay went to the house please and that's why i'll take the opportunity to do this the first thing i want to say is that on the principles everything that professor ramon has said i completely concur with him not just as an economist but also as someone who is a student of insolvency i i think he's completely hit the nail on the head i mean our, the articulation probably we do and how he does may vary now on let's say to begin with the measure how do you measure what he mentioned about the recovery is is probably the low hanging fruit because that's the most uh, easy thing to do you know how much have you recovered that's one measuring tool that you have and the two other you mentioned they're all visible tangible you can pluck them they're, they're on the lower branches but the way we really do it and which is the most challenging task and i think that's something which really institutions like i am must be doing is and that's what really is the value add that when you turn around these assets bring them back into the economy by passing a resolution plan what you're really doing is an asset that was lying dormant but which is otherwise capable of contributing to the economy but was in poor management's hands you're really transporting it into the hands of a more competent and able management which will be able to use it optimally in the economy and contribution to the gdp happens no doubt no doubt right and the l- preservation of jobs that's also another of course, objective because of course. that also is because every enterprise has an economy around its own right it it serves an economy and that economy whether it's dormant is activated is is a very important way of measuring the larger success of ibc of course right that is one point 
on 29 well the biggest success yeah. we i mean we are not saying is the behavioral change yes the credit culture change is huge all this is cool quickly respond yes, yes please yes. yeah so you know so this is the point that you made and you know, several people including the bankers made this point that you know what we are doing is a noble task of preserving the enterprise and the jobs and so on you know which is, which is fine but don't you need to preserve incomes and jobs in banking so you see yeah. it cannot be yes. that you preserve the yeah. enterprise yeah. you preserve the enterprise at the cost Completely of the bank agree with you, yes. the bank's capacity yeah. to lend which is right. what has happened and, uh, oh. and in the process no so the, you have undermined the bank's capacity to lend and create new jobs hmm. and therefore therefore it cannot be so i am sorry i you know i have great difficulty in accepting that argument which seems very uh, lofty and noble but i think this, this is why i'm saying there is no getting away from the oh, recovery rate, because yeah. the recovery rate is what strikes the balance between the interests of the enterprise and the interests of the banking system right and in fact to that extent i completely i mean i with all due respect to the supreme court i disagree with the judgment which says that it is it is not meant to be a recovery it I mean, recovery is a very fundamental integral part of the whole resolution process there will not be any resolution without recovery and there will be no incentives for anybody to participate and and we move to insolvency because our other recovery mechanisms like drt and otherwise failed so i completely agree with this i was not disagreeing with you i was only saying that we need to start measuring it uh, at some point no? because i was the, i was making the point of the measuring of the outcome the second point so that i wanted the, to make on, just okay, one second yeah one. because the post two yeah, 29 on, i wanted to make on 29 eh? my 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 opposition or a criticism or disagreement howsoever you may articulate of 29 is well known i wrote a piece which are summed up by saying exactly the point that you made that every person whose name is prem chopra is not a villain right there are people who have may have failed their enterprise or the enterprise may have failed for reasons which cannot be attributed to poor management or dishonesty or inability to pay because of mismanagement or whatever it is there could be external factors which were beyond their control how do you make that distinction that judgment is best left to the lenders because they have a relationship with the borrower whether they can bridge the trust deficit or whether they just want to exit is a choice that they have to make it can't be made by way of a legislative provision it was good for initial years but i think it has been diluted and it needs to be diluted further other and it has a direct linkage with the shrinking of the market for resolution applicants because you disqualify so many people not just the core promoter but the whole ecosystem around it you are in delhi dr vishwanathan is supporting you talk to the decision makers yeah i mean i have been saying and i think there is a there is a beginning to be some flexibility on that is what the point i'm making other than uh, creditor in possession and debtor in possession there has to be a flexible method where say actually where, where people uh, fail because of some reason or other they should be in possession is it the well, uh, when idea? the law that was passed by the parliament in 2013 november which was never notified had a hybrid of the two which is a kind of another avatar of a prepack which is what the world is moving to in the last 10 years if you see singapore if you see what uk is doing right now they are moving away from the traditional verticals of corporate corporate uh, credit and control and debt and possession and moving to a hybrid system where the creditors make a choice if they have a trust deficit with the lenders they will say we'll go in credit and control we want an independent management but where they feel that with some correction that trust mistrust can be bridged then they say okay we will allow him to first right of refusal to present a plan but it has to be under the oversight of an independent professional but you don't cause disruption by changing the management please please moved and disbursed to all the uh, stakeholders whether they are valuers or insolvency professionals and so on is has actually tremendously gone down which definitely would lead to the quality of services or the outputs that's going to go in what we are seeing is maybe a resolution professional is hiring one top valuer firm and then one small valuer firm probably and then arm twisting the other valuer to say that no we are only going to pay you 20000 rupees for a valuation engagement that too we are going to pay you after 12 months from the engagement so i mean 
maybe the cost is going down artificially because that's really not how it's supposed to happen any views on thoughts no i agree i mean penny wise pound foolish so that should not happen but i think even uh, uh, without that arc, we are very cost competitive as we are in so many areas globally i mean i compared to but certainly i don't suggest that i mean l1 we know what that does so i'm not suggesting that at all sir so uh, the main goal of ibc has been to resolve rather than liquidate but uh, we have chosen to have a sequential process like first we go for resolution and if it fails then we go for liquidation cannot this priority be still preserved and we go for a parallel process uh, wherein we gave some waiting factor for a resolution plan rather than a liquidation plan because i find lot of similarity in the process and we are repeating the whole process sequentially leading to delays so can can we come up with some uh, waiting weighing the resolution plan more than the liquidation value Liqu uh, liquidation plans or liquidation of assets and uh, uh, do them parallelly that will save lot of time so i think the priority is very clear and i think it will be a bit chaotic you can use i hear what you are saying that if there is uh, some tasks that have been done twice over you can use that but again you know if lot of time has elapsed it doesn't help i think running them parallel won't make sense but i mean the chief architect is here so you can hear from him i think uh, it's too early to <laughs> experiment right now let us wait for some more time Yeah, no, I hear you. I, yeah. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sir, on the first issue, when we talk about recovery, we barely pay any attention to recovery made to the operational creditors. So it is their interest which are being wiped off very largely by. You didn't hear me at all. I said this is a big misnomer, and I'm requesting IBBI to give you a fact. The OCs have done extremely well through IBC. Correct, correct, and and this could also create a chain of series of uh, insolvency, consequential insolvency by wiping their claims off in the insolvency. Yeah, so I mean, you are not going to give away your company for a few lakhs or a few crores. So most of those get resolved. No one takes the chance of losing their company. Are you with me? No, no, sir. But certainly, I'm not able to clear myself. I'm saying that by wiping off the operational creditors' claim by not giving them. But you are not wiping out because usually what happens is you settle the operational creditor up front to avoid the IBC proceeding. I think in you a, need to know. In a process know, of resolution plan, sir. You need to know the recovery that OCs have got versus FCs. Once you get that ratio, taking pre-IBC also, then we can certainly have a discussion if OCs have got been hit hard. But, Though, sir, my question is in respect of approval of the resolution plan, sir. No, I understood, but you have to take a holistic view. No, if the guy has got his money and gone home, how can you avoid that? No, it is. That it is. I think, in fact, uh, DG yesterday mentioned it. I I think we can collect that. I think, sir. I think I. No, but pre-admission. Correct. Correct. You you are clear. But but in a resolution. No, no. I understood what he's saying, but you have to take it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 
but the idea is that ocs were getting a bad deal pre ivc especially the small ocs because don't forget tata projects and lnt can also be an oc so i'm saying that for the small oc the security guy the catering guy we discussed it at our meetings also for the msmes is it better now or before it is clearly better now because they have huge leverage you're not going to lose your company to save that uh, lakhs of few crores but sir can we have yeah i'm just saying take it together so can I'm we have a reason with you i've understood that in a plan the oc gets liquidation value correct correct which is but you all, you all have all told me that in many cases everyone's getting liquidation value so then it's the same sir on the second aspect can we link pirp to the debt exposure rather than msme because there could be a situation that a msme non msme having a 10 crore of exposure but we are saying open it to everyone yeah that that's if that that happens then it doesn't survive thanks uh so my uh, one of the point i want to make is about uh, how interim financing is being viewed at a lot of comments have come forth saying that it's like throwing good money after bad bad money so instead of looking at it as if you are throwing bad money after bad money can it be seen as uh, 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 like a priority sector lending or uh, like we we have a rule that we have to give way to the ambulance so when a corporate is on the road of uh, uh, reviving so why can't we have a kind of priority sector lending making the banks uh, spare out a particular sum for uh, that kind of lending I, i mean it's a good thought but i think it'd be very difficult uh, i think the better one is uh, in uh, sumans and what i think maybe you mentioned that uh, this is something that you have to make it uh, market attractive and bring in other players because you know if sbi is already stuck with thousands of crores it's going to be very tough for their board to write another check though you heard that they are considering it they've got the parameters uh, and of course it's it is priority by the way it's super priority and you're going to get a much higher interest rate but there are other players which uh, suman knows well international players who do this for a living so maybe you need to bring in those guys and uh, i mean i don't think that Mr Batra is offering baba usko AMC karke he'll head the AMC no but no 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 but the lend no but who will take the lending decision so the problem doesn't go away so you're passing the buck from the banker to this so so no so yeah but the vigilance people will go after this fellow for the on the same ground you know so i mean the thing is that you know this entire process and the you know recovery and all that it has to gain a certain amount of credibility for bankers to have the courage to attempt interim finance so this process has to play out and you know the entire process has to gain far higher credibility with the with you know with parliament and with the general public before bankers can have the courage to do that. i mean conceptually yes i mean if you know if you think that you know there's a case for lending you should do it but the point that mr swaminathan made is a very valid one try convincing the board to approve a credit decision of that kind but, it's an appeal task but we also professor we have also have the fema issues because there are foreign players because the coupon is so rich who are willing to do it but i think rbi has some concerns on that but because it will be a high coupon yeah. so because uh, this will also prevent uh, cds from falling into liquidation then no 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 question sir good afternoon and thank you for some of the plain speaking today uh, my uh, question and uh, request for some views uh, i'll request attention to the fact that success of any uh, major resolution lies in uh, the, uh, the the capability of reaching out to the as many resolution applicant as possible in that regard compare the ecosystem with the uh, investment banking 
system whereby there is a M and A leak table and and many of uh, the connected dots. Whereas IP is as the born investment bankers. So how do we strengthen their hands uh, in terms of creating some kind of marketplace, be it electronic or physical, to reach out to the prospective resolution applicant? That that is a big question mark. Always I have in my any thoughts, please. Thank you. That's a very good question. We've talked about this, that uh, IBB has done some uh, on, uh, efforts on this, maybe, as you say, together through the associations, uh, through investment bankers. Certainly, there have been, in the larger cases, investment bankers involved. But uh, basically, it's something that uh, the, uh, uh, the ecosystem has to develop with the regulator. I, I think together we need to do this. Thank you. Platform. I mean, just my thought. So, don't we think uh, we can create an online platform? Which, sir, rightly mentioned, today I have to say, sir, international market is a good thing. Sir, I have to say, I have to say, I have Within 24 hours, same way uh, as SBI is the lead banker, thousand, thousands of crores are stuck. So, within this whole process, you know, one can't sell. I if you permit, today the money is worth 200 crores, two years, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So, because of the law, because of so many judicial involving many stakeholders, can we come out with a little bit, uh, in between this initial becoming NPA, there is no CA report, uh, which you know, can prescribe account or khara ho jayega. So with the using of the digital form, many of this, the government does a lot. I mean, be flexible, uh, empower the COC, what is written in the Supreme Court, say, practical out, becho, I mean, using the online auction on the digital globally, I mean, my just uh, thoughts adding to Mr. what uh, Rahul mentioned. No, the, the, I think RBI and some of the banks are working on a secondary market for loan uh, platform, yes. electronic platform. So that is coming, I believe, very, very soon. Yeah, I mean, that will uh, result into a more recovery and increasing that what of course. Sir said, you know, intent. Practical, I mean, saying that. The la this will be the last, sorry. IBB already has installed this platform for distress assets. Yes. So that pro uh, provides a platform in which uh, buyers can bid for these assets. And it's a transparent way. Yes, it is being used, but more awareness needs to be created. In fact, this platform has not just for uh, inviting bids, but also a provision for inviting bid for interim finance also to a reverse auction process. So, I mean, those outside the COC can also participate in this. Yeah, possibly more awareness. Uh, Marketing and awareness. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you to my esteemed panelists and you have been a fantastic audience. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, esteemed panelists, for that uh, thought-provoking discussion and giving us all plenty of uh, food for thought. And thank you for engaging with the audience and addressing all the questions. Uh, I now request Professor M.P. Ram Mohan from IMA to please present mementos to our distinguished panel members. Uh, so I request you to please present the memento to Dr. T.K. Vishwanathan. Uh, to Shri Bhairam Vakil, uh, to Shri A. Uni Krishnan, and to Professor T. T. Ram Mohan. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will now break for uh, lunch and after lunch we will have simultaneous presentations in uh, seminar hall 1, 2 and this auditorium. And uh, the presentations will continue till 5 p.m. and then we will reconvene for concluding the conference at uh, around 5.15, 5.30. Thank you everyone.